All right. Well, uh, for everybody that is just joining us, uh, my name is Holly Barrett. I'm the executive director of the Omaha Downtown Improvement District. You are joining us this evening for our annual security forum. Uh, this is something that our organization has been doing every year since we uh, came into existence in 2007. This is a great opportunity both to hear from our officers, the police officers, um, and then from the community to find out what issues you're seeing and, and what are things that uh, we need to get out there and look at a little bit more. We are going to hear from a, a, a slew of people this evening, and then we're going to have a question and answer session at the very end. So um, we're going to, if you have questions that you don't want to forget, please go ahead and write them in the chat. And then if they don't get answered in the presentation, when we go into the question and answers part, we're gonna be taking questions live from the audience, but we will make sure that we answer anything in the chat that doesn't get asked. We did also get a number of really fantastic questions during the registration process. So again, if those questions do not get answered during the presentation, we're gonna make sure that we circle back. We've got a whole list of them right here so that we can make sure everything gets answered. Um, so again, I'm Holly Barrett. I'm the executive director of the Omaha Downtown Improvement District. I am joined here this evening uh, by my security committee chair, uh, Tim Malik, who is with First National. We also have our Lionsgate security officers. These are the private security officers that, that we have. We also have a couple members of the police department, Omaha Police Department. And then we also have the mayor's office uh, homeless services coordinator. So we're gonna hear from a whole wide range of people. But before we do anything, Christina, if you could go to the next slide, I'm gonna give just a brief overview of the DID programs for anyone who is unfamiliar with us. Um, I'm gonna go pretty quickly so that, if, so that folks that are familiar with it aren't gonna get bored. If during the question and answers, um, there is anything uh, that you wanna ask about that's not security related, that's also a good place. Go ahead and put it in the chat. And if it's not something that we're gonna address tonight, I can be sure to get out back to you uh, individually. So um, first and foremost, um, Christina, we've got that screen again, that black screen going through the, there it's on, thank you. Um, so first and foremost, our main three mission programs are clean, green, safe, which we're going to talk about in a second, and active. Um, clean and green, our clean and green team are our most visible uh, teammates. We've got five members of the team. Actually, right now we only have four. We have a position open, so if anyone's interested or knows anyone, uh, let me know. Um, our clean and green team is out 364 days a year. The only day we take off is Christmas. We uh, have 75 blocks to cover. So we've got a pretty wide range to get to. So we have a, um, a, a program in place where, you know, we go through the highest volume areas like Old Market early in the morning. Then we spread out into the rest of the district, and then we come back and we hit those hot spots. But what that means is that sometimes things will happen during the day and our team will have moved away. So we always encourage you, please call the office, uh, send an email to our info line. Anytime there's anything crazy, if there, uh, sometimes those pigeons make a huge mess and our, our power washer has been um, in the shop all winter, but we're getting it out now and doing some, some spring cleaning. So we've already identified a couple of places, but those are the kinds of things we love for you to call in so that we can make sure we hit them. Our green team is just about to kick off. Um, We're planting our, some uh, annuals early this year so that there's gonna be some beautification for the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. And we've also got some trees that we're starting to think about getting in now that the ground is um, thawing out. And then of course, uh, once spring really rolls around, that's when we're really gonna ramp up a lot of our spring planting. Uh, if anybody is a property owner here or they are uh, a member of their own team that takes care of their own property, if you would like to contact us and talk about uh, how we can share some of those duties, please let me know. 
We also have an activation committee and our advocacy and promotion arm is pretty strong. That's everything from event sponsorships to making sure that our weekly newsletter is populated with all of the events, maybe any sales, any new things that are opening, any important news that needs to get out. So I would assume that all of you are getting that newsletter, but if you're not, uh, please go on our website and sign up. Um, we're also on Facebook for uh, the Downtown Improvement District, and we also manage the Old Market Association Facebook pages. So if you have ever, ever have any questions about either of those two things, go ahead and let us know. Um, Christina, why don't you go to the next slide? All right, well, this is what we're really here to talk about. This is the safety program. Uh, this is fully one third of our budget because it's one of the most important pieces of, uh, of what we do. We work with Lionsgate Security, which is a private security firm that has a whole lot of large contracts down here. So for example, they have the Omaha Performing Arts Center, the Orpheum, and a few others throughout there. And the reason we, we work with guys that have such a big presence is that it means that if something does actually happen, we have more officers down here uh, than are, are normally just on our beat. So it's a really great partnership to work with them. We have officers out uh, throughout the year, but we have a couple of times where we have extra officers. So those high volume times um, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, we always have extra guys out and they will be out from 7 p.m. Uh, to 7 a.m. Um, really taking care of all of those late night hours. We also have officers throughout the week, Monday through Wednesdays from four o'clock to 10 p.m. Um, on any of the major quote unquote drinking holidays. So, you know, St. Patrick's Day, uh, 4th of July, maybe sometimes there's, there's something big that's happening during the year. We contract with uh, Lionsgate and occasionally with the off-duty police officers um, to make sure that we have extra coverage down here for when we need it. Our officers, our Lionsgate officers are in uniform, they're unarmed, but they're in uniform and uh, they have several foot patrol beats that they do regularly. You also will occasionally see their cruisers down here. And even sometimes they, they might be on bikes. Um, we also have access to things like if we need to have a, a cruiser parked somewhere that's been a troubled spot that we just wanna have a little extra presence at, that's also something that, that we work with them to do. Um, and again, a lot of our work is reactionary. So when you are seeing something specific that's happening, if you call us directly, sometimes we can work with you to, to really help get some things done. Um, there is also, this is my, my favorite line. I always love telling everybody about this. We have an escort service available. It's not that kind of escort service, guys. It's an escort service for our late night employees, mostly. Um, anytime someone is leaving uh, their place of business, say at two o'clock in the morning, they're not feeling so safe about walking to their car. They can call the number available and, and, and we can give them um, a, an escort to their vehicle. It's not something that gets used that often, but, um, but it's really nice to have it there when we need it. Um, okay, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Tim Malik. Tim is the chair of our security committee. Uh, also, just a, a note. Um, all of our committees, our pedestrian amenities committee, our activation committee, and our security committee, these are open to the public, and we love having people come join the meetings. We love having them sit on the committee as a regular member, uh, and, and we certainly have volunteer opportunities and things available there. Tim, why don't you go ahead and take it away and talk about some of our security committee work. Good evening, and thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Tim Malik, and um, I'm the chair of the security committee, and I represent First National Bank um, on the downtown improvement district. And just wanted to uh, spend a few minutes explaining what the focus is of the security committee and uh, some of the things we spend our time doing. Our main focus is making a positive impact on the safety and related services, building relationships and creating avenues for communication and being a resource when there is an issue or a concern that's identified. Um, relationships are key to uh, the services that we provide and the impact that we make. And uh, some of those relationships include, but are not limited to, Lionsgate, which Holly alluded to in the security patrol services that, that they provide, the Omaha Police Department, the Riverfront team, uh, Tamara's team, the city's homelessness support and response team, 
obviously businesses and residents um, in throughout the district and property owners. And one of the most important pieces of these efforts are just creating a um, an avenue for for conversations and communication to take place. Uh, a lot of our focus is on identifying trends, um, identifying who needs to be involved in the response and, and being a resource along the way. Uh, we're also involved in projects. And one project that we're working on right now is through a grant. And um, the intent is to improve lighting um, in alleyways and also add cameras. Uh, we're working in collaboration with the city OPPD and the property owners um, adjacent to these alleys. Currently, we're in design uh, phases, identifying the specifications and, and how to put this in place, as well as a proof of concept of what our solution will be and potentially how we put that uh, concept in place in, a, in an alley um, in the near future. All right. Yeah, that's a really exciting project and it's a wonderful opportunity that's coming out of the COVID recovery funds that uh, the federal government distributed to all of the cities uh, in the last few years. Those funds uh, were available only to nonprofits uh, for a little while there. And uh, the, the last little bits that are left over have been uh, distributed to the business improvement districts. And we are all uh, working on, on security measures like that. So. Um, you'll hear more about that as the project rolls out. But uh, Tim, thank you so much for being a major driver on, uh, on that project for sure. All right, next up, I'm gonna introduce our Lionsgate officers. We have Matt Ricks and Chris Lydon. Um, Matt, and, and we also have Calvin Jones, who's one of the owners of Lionsgate Security. Hi, Calvin. Hi. Um, Matt and Chris, Calvin, would you like to talk a little bit about your work? I'm going to, before you start, I'm going to interject. Matt is one of our guys who's actually out on the streets regularly. Uh, he is one of our, our regular beat officers and manages a whole lot of stuff. He might be a familiar face to some of you. As Tim mentioned, one of the main things that we ask our team to do is check in with business owners and people talk to people on, on the sidewalks and the streets. So um, they also keep a log of every single shift of who they talked to and, and what kinds of things they were seeing so that every meeting, every month when we sit down at the meetings, we can look at these trends and see, okay, these guys are having issues at this time. These guys are having issues, you know, on these days of the week and, and so on and so forth and what's getting better, what's getting worse. So, um, Pass it over to Lionsgate. Um, I'm Calvin Jones. I'm a co-owner of Lionsgate uh, Security. I am retired from the Omaha Police Department. I did a, do a little over two decades with the Omaha Police Department, worked in all parts of the city. Uh, in 2010, we started Lionsgate Security, and we've been working with the Downtown Improvement District, I believe, since 2019. Um, we try to be uh, a deterrent and an extra set of eyes and ears for the police department. Um, we like what we do. We like getting out, uh, uh, going to the businesses and helping the businesses with any issues they might have in, in the area. And basically being an extra set of eyes and ears for the police. We have two people on patrol like Holly um, alluded to. We, we ramp that up uh, in the summertime and especially in June during College World Series. And we have a new director of operations, Chris Lighton. He's on here now. Chris? Hello, folks. Chris, you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Hi, folks. My name is Chris Lighton, and uh, just recently hired with Lionsgate Security. Um, Looking forward to uh, a great future with these guys uh, here at Lionsgate. Um, our main goal downtown is to make sure uh, that we are highly visible uh, for the public to uh, see and to also approach. Uh, we want folks downtown to uh, get to know that Lionsgate is uh, a good security company uh, while providing uh, security and protection for everybody downtown. Um, a good uh, uh, first responder to uh, a lot of incidences down there that uh, we can call uh, OPD if necessary and, and get the proper authority to take care of some issues. So um, 
lots of high visibility and uh, uh, kind of just shaking hands and getting to know the public down there and letting everybody know that it's a great place to come down and enjoy their, you know, Friday, Saturday night. And um, it's a, it's a good safe environment for uh, uh, families to come down and enjoy themselves. So uh, that's our main goal. And uh, Matthew is one of our officers down there and he'll, he'll uh, describe a little bit about what they do uh, on foot on ground. Yeah, uh, as Chris said, um, my name is Matthew Ricks. Uh, I'm um, one of the officers that patrols downtown. I also have another officer with me, uh, or that's Don, that also works with me as well. Um, we just try to stay as visible as possible, keep our eyes open for any highly trouble spots, as well as, um, uh, like like Calvin said, to be that second set of eyes and ears um, for, for any potential problems. Um, there again, um, as Chris also said, that we want to be <clears throat> maintaining being approachable um, and professional at all times. Uh, so you won't see us um, as a, um, or you'll see us, I should say, as a um, a potential avenue for assistance if you guys need anything. So that's what we tried to do uh, as much of downtown as possible. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate you. And again, for everybody that is watching, we're going to have um, questions and answers at the end. So if you want to write your questions, we, it looks like we do have a couple in the chat already. Um, please go ahead and, and put them there so that you don't forget them. Otherwise, um, we will answer a bunch of questions at the end. So all of our panelists will stay on in case you have a specific question. Okay, next up is the Fantastic police department. The, um, we are joined with us tonight uh, by Sergeant Dan Rubin, and I'm going to let him introduce himself and uh, talk about the shifts that he takes care of. He's got some pretty heavy duty stuff. Sergeant Rubin, I'm in charge of the riverfront area. I supervise the riverfront officers, at least during the evening shift and the day shift. We have three officers assigned, they report to the B shift sergeants, and then the evening shift, we have 10 assigned, they report to me. Then I'm here with uh, oh, Lieutenant Schmatter as well as the sea shift lieutenant. Yeah, we went over some of the questions we thought that might be asked. And we wanted to uh, be transparent and, and get those answers out there. Sergeant Rubin's going to answer a majority of these because he's actually assigned down to the old market in the downtown area. And he's uh, been dealing with uh, some issues. And I'll turn this over to him. You mind if we go first, just kind of with some of these questions? Because we have obviously radio that we have to handle at the same time Abs absolutely go ahead okay the biggest ones we saw from your list and we'll cover the homeless thing we'll let Tamara touch on that as well uh, but one of the biggest issues that seemed that was a common theme was the homeless issue downtown uh, overwhelmingly like it's been said before it's not illegal for the homeless people to be homeless that we can't force them off public rights of way uh, one of the big questions they had was about homeless encampments in regards to that <clears throat> they are required to leave an open passage if they're on a public right of way. So unless the street is, or the sidewalk is completely blocked, we can't do much with that. Uh, in terms of getting them off of private property that's down there, something I proposed, and it would be kind of up to the old market to come together on this. Let me scroll down because I got it typed up. Uh, we could do kind of a rotating enforcement where if a business closes, let's say a business closes at 6 p.m., but they want any homeless people off their property after 6 p.m. and on, uh, we can get their name, their date of birth, their business name, their business address, their business phone number. And if they want that prosecuted, we can remove them absent them being a closed business. Uh, it's not really going to end the homeless problem because it will require every business down there to be on board with that. Otherwise, we're just moving them around. And it doesn't have to be, if you guys wanted something like that, they could decline prosecution later. It doesn't have to be, hey, we've arrested this person. Now they're absolutely going to get convicted of this. We can arrest them and they can decide if this person keeps coming to my property, if they want to prosecute later or not. Um, that only really helps if they're bucked up against a business or in a breezeway without an official survey done by a business. Uh, but that's something we could implement down there, but I would need a running list of all the businesses that wanted that done and someone that would act as a witness if they had to get a subpoena to go to court. Uh, the other big questions that were asked, they asked about the public bathrooms and if they're open for anyone to use. I wasn't sure if that was in regards to Gene Leahy or if they wanted public bathrooms opened up within the old market. Uh, in regards to Gene Leahy, that would have to get deferred over to Mecca. If it's in regards to opening public restrooms in the old market area in general, that would be, I guess, a pullback on you guys. I will I will say that would probably make your homeless issue worse because they're going to sleep in those during the winter. 
Um, another question that was asked about the scooters that are being undriven safely. We actually just ran into this about last week. We started dealing with those heavy in the old uh, in the Gene Leahy Mall because the juveniles being on spring break causing issues. One of the things we started doing is we printed off literally 100 handouts of the ordinance. We started handing those out to juveniles, letting them know these are all things you can and can't do on the scooters. And if you're caught doing them, you'll be arrested. It's actually a pretty strict ordinance. Uh, so that was effective in the Gene Leahy Mall. I'll advise my officers to continue to do that throughout the remainder of the old market, to try and get them off the sidewalks because they're not supposed to be on the sidewalks. The only exception to that is if they're under 18, but if they're under 18, they have to have a helmet on. So it's kind of a stricter ordinance than you would expect. And I think that kind of deters quite a bit of the people that are causing problems on them versus just people that are riding them uh, at leisure. <clears throat> Another question I was asked was about police and security patrols in the old market in general, uh, specifically regarding recent drug use outside the steel house with the concerts. Uh, like I said, we have 10 officers assigned in the evening, three during the day, and then myself in the evening. We do normal patrols. We do kind of a roving patrol. In regards to drug use, the steel house, that's the first that's ever been brought to my attention. So we haven't done anything in regards to that yet. If they end up at, again, part of that's going to fall on the steel house and who they're hosting. If they host a, a comp, you know, a concert or a promoter or a rapper or rock band or what have you that, <clears throat> um, excuse me, that promote drug use, obviously they're going to have more people that go to the concert that are going to participate in that. I think the more recent example, I can't remember the group, but it was, a, I think it was an electric dance music EDM uh, person and they had several overdoses over there because of that because it's more of like a party you know rave environment uh we can increase our patrols we've been hitting the garages pretty hard the last couple of months to deter the theft from motor vehicles we've done probably hundreds of patrols per month amongst all the riverfront officers during the d shift hours the 7p to 3a um in terms of enforcing drug use with that if it's not something we could smell we don't have reasonable suspicion to walk out uh, which is something we need to or a traffic stop. So that may help with private security or lines get rolling through because they can report to us and say, hey, someone's, you know, doing a line of coke or popping pills in the car. That gives us more of a reason to go approach this car on the third floor of the parking lot versus catching it while we're doing kind of a roving patrol. It's not going to stand out or be obvious enough to jump on top of, uh, except, you know, something like marijuana use, for example, be more obvious you can smell it and see it. Um, uh, the someone asked about better lighting in the corners and alleyways. Again, that would fall on you guys and OPPD. That wouldn't be something we would normally tackle, but it'd probably be useful. The more lighting you have, the better it is to light up an area and deter crime. Uh, and then someone asked about graffiti and what we can do with graffiti. That I would defer to the graffiti task force, which is the mayor's hotline. The gang unit tracks what kind of tagging they're doing and what their signs and logos are and names are. And the gang unit enforces that because they can figure out who's using this specific logo or this specific moniker uh, when they tag stuff. And they also are quick about coming out and getting it covered back up um, in lieu of the business having to do that at their own expense. I believe they do it for private business as well on top of just private property. <clears throat> um, and then the, uh, let's see, the questions that have been asked in the Q&A is it safe to have employees work by themselves? Uh, yes and no, it depends what time of night and kind of what you're expecting to happen and what your business is hosting. If you're a business that does a lot of cash business and you have one employee by themselves, you may be more prone or targeted for casing for robbery. Again, I will say that we have a lot of presence in the old market and the old market during those riverfront hours, that 7P to 3A are very quick to act and make arrests. So we're generally no more than a block away, but that would be kind of up to a business to evaluate kind of what type of business they're doing, what type of clientele they drive in and out and whether or not they're likely to be cased. And then another question was about let me read this one. This one just popped up a little bit ago about the unfortunate attack of the woman on her way to Union Pacific. So the horror stories of physical assaults in the parking garages. <clears throat> I don't think the parking garages are really any more dangerous than other areas of downtown. Um, it's just unfortunate that it happened. They did end up identifying and arresting the suspect in that case in particular. Um, I would treat that more of a, as a one-off. And that's kind of the same issue you would have there. It, it would occur anywhere in the city. You can have someone that has mental health disorders freaking out any given street corner, any given area, anywhere in the city. It just depends where they pop up. So I wouldn't consider that more of an unsafe area for the old market. Um, the only difference there is we have a bit of a higher presence of them because it's a big drop-off point. But I'll let Tamara touch on that a bit more. And then questions I had for you guys. You mentioned an escort service. How far does that area stretch? What what businesses would that encompass? What block to what block do they had? Methodist open an urgent care facility at 312 South 15th looking for um, <clears throat> employees 
going to and from at the end of their business day to their cars. Um, and it's something they wanted our assistance with, but if Lionsgate covers that service area, and then if not, if I could still just get a contact on what they cover, this way when a business asks for that in particular, I can defer that over to Lionsgate so they can work with them as an escort service to and from vehicles if they feel on the same. Yeah, um, Sergeant, we the, the escort service would be throughout the downtown district, which goes from the riverfront up to 17th and from uh, Leavenworth to Cass, roughly. Um, and so the, the new health center that's going in is right there in it. Um, and we can forward um, uh, the Lionsgate information to you so that you can talk to them about how that would work because we would, we'd love to help. Yeah, and then I can save that for any other businesses that have that same concern or same issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Holly, I just, I want to just add, there was uh, one other thing about the motorcycles uh, racing into Council Bluffs. Um, just, just so you know, the traffic unit has been conducting operations on this. Um, officers have been coming into work over time for this specific issue. A police helicopter has been up as well. So we, it, we have been able to make some enforcement action regarding that situation. Uh, so, I mean, I just wanted you to know that we're aware of it and it, it's something that's being addressed. Um, as Sergeant Rubin said, uh, Tamara is going to handle quite a bit of the homeless population questions. We might um, jump in on that portion as well as something that law enforcement would do in conjunction with her. And if you don't mind, can you tell them uh, what we've been doing extra with the parking garages? So <clears throat> it was brought to our attention there was an increase in theft from motor vehicle in the parking garages in District 51, which encompasses that old market area, everything from coming to uh, was it cut off Pacific Street and then basically 16th through the riverfront. Um, what we've done with that is they started a Google Sheet and every riverfront officer was assigned to hit. It didn't matter which, but we created a, a list of all the garages and it was tracked on a Google Sheet. They needed to put their serial number what time they hit this garage and they need to enter that and hit at least two per officer per shift. And that resulted in probably hundreds of extra patrols. Kind of waxed and waned in its efficacy initially. It seemed like there was a massive drop in theft from motor vehicle. I know they were able to make an arrest of a theft from motor vehicle suspect that they knew was known to hit cars that were in the parking garages and throughout the old market. Uh, but then it kind of waned again. They're still doing the patrols. But we kind of saw that number bump up again relative to last year. A lot of that also has to do with the weather. Obviously, it's negative 10 or really cold out, people are less likely to be going downtown in the first place. And it's going to be less likely someone's going to try and get into a less crowded and more vacant parking garage to break in a vehicle because as the weather warms up, that obviously becomes an issue again. We haven't stopped those patrols, uh, but again, it's one of those things where we, we can only target so many things at once. So eventually we're going to have to stop the roving garage patrols and defer that to private security, um, except for obviously the Park Omaha ones because eventually we're going to become inundated with some of the issues with the park and the juveniles and the crowds and the bars and all the other issues that we run into, right? Um, and then it looks like, just going through the chat on top of the Q&A, someone asked what security company is in charge for the new park. It's Mecca is hiring 402 security, so Mecca is in, in charge of that. It uh, looks like they mentioned them huddling up. The places that their security usually huddles up are where we have our big uh, juveniles. So I'll, walk, I'll see them roll through the park pretty frequently in their gators. The times they tend to huddle up are kind of in the evenings and they huddle up in the areas where we're having these higher concentrations, uh, specifically 11th and Farnham and 8th and Farnham by the roller rink and then that big open breezeway that, you know, 11th and Farnham continued as a roadway where that kind of courtyard area is. Those seem to be where we have the big issues, which is why you see them huddled up in a group over there. And they're kind of on board with what we're doing. We're working with them pretty closely on coming up with different innovations uh, without getting into all the details. We have different innovative solutions that we're trying to implement down there to make those issues go away with the juveniles and the fights. Uh, we're trying to tackle it from base. I, I, I don't want to get into a whole smorgasbord of details. We're tackling it from about five different ways. So. And then home is sleeping there, bathrooms that are locked and no one can use them. Uh, I know that Mecca controls the bathrooms in the park, so it's up to them when those open and close. I think they usually close them at nine because that starts to push out some of the, again, the juveniles that linger in the park as well for homeless. And the motorcycles, yep, we're going to try to do what we can with the motorcycles. And again, a lot of that gets deferred to our traffic units. They handle a lot of those operations. And I wasn't sure if they meant the Bob, when they said that bridge, I wasn't sure if they meant 480 or Bob Carey, but obviously if they're on the Bob Carey bridge, we're going to try and snag them off going either way. They're on 480 with our third party liability law and pursuing a motorcycle just becomes kind of a, a hassle for us. We'll do what we can, obviously. 
Uh, but that's going to defer to what kind of operations we're running that night and a cable one is overhead. Fantastic. Sorry, well, I don't thank you with a ton at once. I just want to get all of our stuff out of the way so we have to run out, we can. Ab absolutely. And stay on as long as you can. If you have to to take off our boogie, we we, we will understand. Um, folks, I also took a couple of notes on some of the the uh, things that they were talking about so we can um we can flesh it out a little bit more if if our officers have to actually leave. Um Okay, um, let's see, what do we have up next? Um, I think that it's time to go to our resources page um, in our presentation and have Tamara Dwyer, who is the Mayor's Office Homeless Services Coordinator, take it away. Hold on, we'll, we'll wait for Christina to catch up. Sorry, you can just go ahead um, if she has a presentation to share. I don't think that she does, but Tamara, you can go ahead and Christina, if you could put the resources page up in, while she's talking, that would be great. I, I mean, I have a presentation, but I can go through it or share it. I can't share my video or I can't share my video. It won't let me do that, but um, I can talk through my presentation or show it. It's kind of up to you. If you can show it, that would be great. Okay, no problem. Oh, there's a video, okay. Let's see. Y'all can see this, right? Yep. Okay. So this should be quick. Hopefully it's not too long. And um, if you have questions at the end or throughout, I don't know if I'll catch them throughout, but I'm gonna go over some of the things that we're doing here in the mayor's office. Um, in regards to homelessness in Omaha and hopefully answer some of your questions. Okay, so my position, homeless services coordinator, um, been in the mayor's office for a little over a year, um, currently working on uh, active location conferencing. Within that, um, there's uh, encampment response strategy, um, developing a safety assessment it's almost complete um ready for us to use that we've been putting together for reported um encampment sites in omaha and then a cleanup process if that's needed um working in coordination with some contractors with the city for that um also create an emergency rehousing action plan that was completed in January. There might be a couple of minor details, um, but that, that's in response to situations where the city has to vacate larger or really any kind of apartment complexes or places that have tenants, um, kind of like legacy crossing, um, just so we have a, a clear plan in place and coordination if that ever does have to happen again. Um, working towards a need better. Tamara, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you because I think if you're if you are thinking your presentation is moving, it's actually stuck on the first screen. Oh, I'm no, it's fine. I'm talking through it. Okay. Yep. Can you see it? I mean, um, well, it. we I, only see the first screen. We we haven't seen any oh. other slides. Oh, wait a second. Hmm. It says it's paused. While I don't know why. Maybe try stop sharing and then resharing it. There, it just moved. There we go. You can it's see it now. There. I'll just keep it small, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if that's okay, if everyone can see it, okay. Um. So, okay. So I was on veteran homelessness. That's one of the priority focus areas for the mayor. And um, I participate in the Built for Zero efforts within our community um, with the with the VA, with the Team of Care Match and um, ICA, which is the data um, data system admin administrators for our local Team of Care, and then also another focus area, hopefully to start this year, um, would be homeless prevention because the mayor does recognize and know that. Um, without strengthening prevention efforts, we won't really get to end homelessness in Omaha. And these are just a, uh, the priority 
focus areas for Mayor Stother. Um, of course, unsheltered homelessness, veteran homelessness, um, unified and collaborative responses, um, homeless, homelessness prevention, and of course, the ultimate goal to end homelessness in Omaha. Um, some data that we had started collecting in 2023 um, so last time I met with you all, I didn't have another person. Now I do have another staff member that works with me, um, Kurt. He was trying to join and he wasn't able to join, but either way, he, um, does our street outreach and he's a street outreach community liaison. So he works with community organizations, neighborhoods, people experiencing homelessness. And since he started in August, we've been really able to collect some good data on kind of the stuff that we're doing. Um, so the last half of 2023, um, we were able to serve over 90 people, reconnect them or connect them to some kind of services. And then there's a little breakdown here. <clears throat> 25 people referred to street outreach, 27 assessed for housing resources, seven people were connected to emergency shelter, and 50 people were reconnected to case managers that were looking for them or had lost them and needed to reconnect with them. Um, also with that, we had delivered 34 notices to vacate for city-owned property, and only about 18 of them were needing additional cleanup due to the efforts um, that we were making to kind of help people move their stuff with them if that was needed or clean up after themselves, that kind of thing. Um, something that we do every year with the continuum of care and all the different service providers is some is called the point in time count. So it's a snapshot of um, people who are experiencing homelessness within a continuum of care. Um, uh, that, that's a geographical region that is defined by HUD for our area, it is Douglas County, Sarpy County, and Potawatomi County. So this data is related to all three counties. Um, it's conducted every January on the last 10 days of January. Um, Nebraska does a statewide point in time count and that the whole state does it at the same time. So not a lot of states do that, um, but we do here in Nebraska. Um, the results of that report go through HUD, and then HUD reports it to Congress through the Annual Homelessness Assessment Report, or the AHAR. The AHAR is used to inform decisions with funding, policy, research on a federal level. Um, and then the housing inventory count kind of goes in um, partnership with the point in time count, and that's um, the capacity of shelter beds or housing programs that are um, meant to serve people who are experiencing homelessness or moving out of homelessness. Um, let me move on. So our 2023 point in time data is what we have. Last year we had 2022. HUD is about... Uh, not eight or nine months usually behind. Um, I don't know that they have completely, or I don't know if the submission has went through yet. They have lots of data analysis that, that happens after the point in time count and the housing inventory count and a lots of um, data cleanup and everything like that before they finally submit it to HUD. So usually in the springtime is when that happens and then HUD verifies it on their end and then usually in the fall sends it back and say, hey, it's good. You guys can all share this. Um, so probably look in the fall to have our 2024 numbers. This was 2023. So um, a total of 1,475 people were experiencing homelessness in the three county area, um, up 146 from the last year. So typically that's kind of what we see if you see that it's up for 2021 when we had a Lots of efforts on the um, inflow. So like there was eviction moratorium, there was lots of rental assistance and those kinds of programs that were affecting the inflow a lot. Um, so it decreased quite a bit in 2021. But for the most part, we see our numbers shift up and down a bit. Um, 179 were in transitional housing, 205 were unsheltered, and that is a rise from previous years. We can see since 2020, it has been rising for our unsheltered numbers. 
but our overall population has not risen at the same rate. Um, and then there were 1,091 folks in emergency shelter. Um, another thing that we collect with the point in time count is the zip code of the person's um, last permanent residence. And this, this question comes up a lot, so I usually bring it to my presentations. Um, for the unsheltered population, what we saw in 2023 was a 48% had previously lived in the Council Bluff zip code. That was our last permanent address. 36% um, had a Omaha zip code, city of Omaha zip code. 12.5% um, lived outside of the tri-county area somewhere. So they were in a different part of the state, maybe in a different state. And then um, 4% lived in another part of the tri-county area. So they weren't in Council Bluffs or Omaha. So maybe they were in Bellevue or in Douglas County outside of Omaha, those different areas. Um, another piece I like to point out, since the mayor does um, prioritize veteran homelessness, we did have a total of 92 veterans um, in 2023 that were experiencing homelessness. 24 of those were in transitional housing of some kind, 64 mm -hmm. emergency shelter, and four were unsheltered. A way that everyone can help um, is of course, having resources available, like the coordinated entry access points, get people connected to those services that are appropriate for them. Um, there's a link and I'll share this with Christina too. All the links are in there. Everything is linked um, to their website that has their information, their flyers, um, who are their current access points. And then they have a street outreach line that is a message line. So it's not an emergency line or anything like that. So you'll leave a message and uh, somebody from Street Outreach will contact them and set up some kind of a meet or intake or something like that. And then here are some resources, if anyone's interested, just different resources um, about homelessness um, and ways to help. All right. So thank you so question. much, Tamara. Yeah. Um, Christina, if you could, I think you're about to do it. Oh, there it is. Um, so uh, one of the things that that we always like to do on our website is uh, collect all of the resources of everybody that we possibly can. So um, it, this is not a live page on our website, but if it were, you could click on any of those drop down menus and it's everything from there's a street light out to graffiti to the mayor's hotline. Um, to right here, which is talking about some of the resources. And again, it's a little hard to see on this screen. It'd be a lot easier when you're actually on your computer. Um, but these are direct links to our service providers, to security resources and, and things like that. So um, I know that there's always a lot of questions and I think we already got a couple and um, Sergeant Rubin alluded to, to some of the solutions. We, again, it is not a crime to be homeless. Um, it is a crime if they are on a posted trespassing place or if they're actually blocking the sidewalk. It is a crime if they are aggressively panhandling. It is a crime if they're doing drugs in public, that kind of stuff. Um, but those are the obvious things. Those are the obvious ones that it is pretty easy for the police to come in and say, yep, this is a no and, and we're gonna figure it out. It's the less obvious ones that are um, the, the, the folks that we see every day. And again, I wanna remind everybody that those numbers that we saw are actually not as large as we think they are, um, which is a good thing. Uh, it means that it is an accomplishable goal to be able to uh, come up with affordable housing and transitional housing services and things. It, it, is, it is something that we can do. It's just gonna yeah. take a lot of resources and a lot more work. Um, the 147 unsheltered, um, uh, great question, David, and I will, I will get into that in just a second. Um, the 147 unsheltered, these are the folks that we see 
pretty regularly. A lot of us that are out there all the time, we actually know these guys by name. Um, we talk to them regularly and, um, and we know when they're in a good mood, when they're in a bad mood, when we need to actually call and get some help um, and when we need to just live, let them live because they are a part of the neighborhood. Um, but it's when somebody is starting to have an episode or it's when something, I'm gonna answer David's question right now. He asked, what's the difference between panhandling and aggressive panhandling? Panhandling is someone just standing there with a sign or maybe as you're walking by saying, hey, do you have any change? Aggressive panhandling is somebody who's following you, asking for change, um, who's being uh, really belligerent about it. Um, and, and anytime you are feeling incredibly uncomfortable, not just uncomfortable because you're out of your comfort zone, um, but uncomfortable for your safety. That's when things become aggressive. And those are the instances that we want you to call 911, that across the board, we want the police to be able to deal with that. They have um, not just the officers themselves are trained, but they also have um, folks within the department that are trained to deal with somebody having a mental episode, um, they are also familiar with the folks that they're talking to. Again, these are people that they know regularly. Um, so the, are you uncomfortable or not? That is up to you. Everybody's threshold is a little bit different. So we always want to tell anybody, if you are feeling uncomfortable, call 911 and, and they will figure it out. Um, if you want to help, if you want to do something, we ask that you don't give money out unless it's someone that you know and, and, it's, um, and it's a situation where you feel confident that you know they're using it for food or, or whatever it is that they're asking for. Um, otherwise, we ask you to just walk on or to call the outreach service numbers. And we're gonna provide you with a whole bunch of those. Again, we've got, um, We've got uh, resources listed on our on our website. Tamara has a whole list of brochures and things. Um, and, and then we have our Lionsgate officers. So our Lionsgate officers are out there. And, and as they have said, their main job is to be extra eyes for the police and an extra calming presence for everyone else. Um, they are also sometimes the front lines. They are the ones who, if somebody is, is making someone very uncomfortable, but um, it's not necessarily something that we would call 911 for, our officers can go in and they can make sure that, um, that they're talking to the people that they're offering services if they want, and that if things escalate, our officers are trained to know when they need to call the police or when they can handle something on their own. So um, there were also a couple of processes uh, that the sergeant had referred to as far as um, banning and barring. It's, a, it's kind of a trespassing issue. We do have a number of properties downtown that have posted no trespassing signs. Um, that's the first step. The other step is to make sure that your business, your contact information, uh, your hours, your desires, all of that is registered with the police department so that if they see that somebody is sleeping up against your business and you have that no trespassing sign out, that the police have all of the information that they can go in and say, hey, you are really not supposed to be here and, and we, have, we have proof. Um, so we can help walk individual properties through that. It is a bit of a process. And he also mentioned um, you have to have somebody that's willing to be the, the quote unquote victim. This is the person who, if anything ever happened that, that charges had to be pressed and, and, and generally speaking, being moved by the police or even by our officers has been enough of a deterrent that we are not seeing very often. Now, sometimes we do, but most often we don't see repeat offenders. We might see the, the, the spot filled with a new person, but generally speaking, one or two bad interactions, people tend to start going the other place or the other direction. So we don't have to actually um, turn this into a criminal situation. But again, if something really is escalating, that's when we would call the police department in. That's when our officers would call the police department in as well. So, um, and that is again, a personal thing. So, uh, but we do need to have somebody that can sign the paper and say, yes, this incident happened to me and um, and then be available if they if they need to have questions. Um, I, oh, my screen went away. There, it's back again. Um, I'm going to quick jump into the question and answers and the chat and make sure that I haven't missed anything. Um, and then we'll move right into questions and answers from the audience. 
Um, let's see. All right, we'll talk about the the security repair or the uh, sidewalk repair one at the end after security issues. Um, we know you've got an issue. Um, there was a question about the ARPA funds, um, um, using the, those funds for anything outside of new cameras and streetlights. At this point, no. Uh, the ARPA funds have been from the feds have designated that those funds that are being used by the BIDs in particular, those have to be for security upgrades. Um, the, the, they distributed a whole bunch of recovery funds to other organizations that were doing other programs, but those that are being used specifically by the business improvement districts of which that's what we are, um, those are specifically for security upgrades. And I'm going to run into the chat real quick. Make sure I think that Sergeant Rubin answered a lot of this. Oh, um, one thing I wanted to throw out about Mecca, the, the question about um, who, who takes care of things in the riverfront. Mecca works with 402 Security, and it recently they upgraded and uh, have brought on a whole slew of new officers. One of the reasons, again, that, that Sergeant said that, they're, that you're seeing an extra group right there is that those hotspots that are being identified, they now have extra officers that their job is to be right there at the whole time. They have a whole slew, a whole other team of officers that patrol the rest of the parks, but those guys that you're seeing there, they are being paid to patrol right there and to make sure that that area has presence. So that's one of the reasons why you are seeing that right there. Um, the Riverfront Security does come to our security committee meetings every month, just like the police in the Lions Gate and, uh, and anyone else that's interested. So again, this is a great committee if you are interested in, in, um, in getting involved or, or even just learning more about it. Um, another um, uh, answer that I want to throw out about bathrooms. Uh, um, the, oh, sorry, I thought that the officers were, were asking something. Um, the, um, yeah, sorry, I was going to touch on what you were saying briefly. Oh, Someone, go ahead. Um, something about dues or taxes for the park security, that's all covered by MECA. So the private, private side of it is handling all the payments. So that's how those security officers are being paid. Technically, they can assign them and put them wherever they want because they're a private park and they're paying, they're putting the entirety of that bill. So we can't force them to do things, but they're working closely enough with us uh, with enough solutions that we're coming up with that I feel comfortable with their security doing what they're supposed to down there. I wouldn't call that a big issue at this point. Um, I just want to touch on that briefly. Yeah, that that's a great point, and I didn't even go there. Um, everything that happens in the park is privately funded. This is, they, no public taxes are being used for either maintenance, security, parties, events, anything that is all privately funded. So um, that's pretty fantastic. Um, uh, also, the streetcar is also completely already funded through other avenues. It's not um, it's not coming from our taxpayers. So just something to, to think about when when big projects like that happen. Um, Quickly about the bathrooms. Mecca does have their bathrooms open, I believe, from 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. Uh, they do close them at 9 p.m. because they're trying to get people to, to recognize that the park is shutting down. It closes at 11 entirely, lights out. Um, there are public bathroom facilities in other places. For example, the, the city, um, the, the parking lot down at 10th and Jackson does have facilities, but they are, um, the city has, is not able, they don't have the resources to keep them open and keep them clean and safe. So they have uh, looked at a couple of, we've looked at doing it. The problem is, is that it's another $40,000 a year expense in trying to keep those open. We absolutely would love to do that. But right now we don't have 40,000 that we can just devote to that. So um, it's something that, that we're looking into trying to find funding so that we could take over a contract to be able to maintain those bathrooms. We 100% understand that that we don't have enough down here. But right now, when people do come into your places of business and are asking if they can use the bathroom, um, if they're between 7 and 9 a.m. or 7 a.m. and 9 p.m., you send them over to the park. That's where they are. 
And those motorcycles, guys, thank you so much for staying on top of that. It's good to hear that that they're trying a couple new things. We know that there was an arrest made that the um, that there was the helicopter out a couple of times and that they they have been able to get a couple of those guys. Those mini bikes, for those of you that are listening, uh, they're those real loud little like they look like dirt bikes and and the kids go up on the hind wheels and they go screaming down the road and they are really loud and really fast and the cop cars literally cannot catch them they are that fast so they have to have a coordinated effort to be able to to even get around but um but again that takes a lot of resources and um and these these little gangs of of bikes that are coming down they are super smart and they seem to evade <laughs> um Let's see, a couple of other questions talking about um, panhandling is definitely something that has been addressed. Um, and, and that's where the word aggressive is very important because it really, it's not illegal for them to ask for money. It is illegal for them to follow you or touch you um, or say things that are, are, um, are really in, uncomfortable. So um, Sergeant Rubin, do you want to say anything more about that? I think you were the one that put that up there. I'm sorry. Can you throw that one more time? I was typing a question to the, uh, la the answer to the last question in the chat here. Talking about the difference between the aggressive hand. That was you that was answering oh, that question. Yes. Never mind. So, <laughs> yeah. So I attached the stuff for the ordinance in terms of the aggressive panhandling. There's a lot of stipulations that can fall under aggressive panhandling. I can pull it up again real quick. <clears throat> Let me see. This one. Just so you guys are all aware and can pass this on. So they can't be within 15 feet of a person that's using an ATM or anything that spends cash. Uh, repeated panhandling requests if they were refused, ignored, or declined. So if they say no, I'm not going to give any money and they continue to ask, that would fall under aggressive panhandling. Uh, if they're stationary or in a line or stopped in traffic, that's considered aggressive panhandling. So if they're waiting for, say, a food truck line or a business line, they can't go up to them because they're waiting in line for a business. Uh, touching the person, obviously, that straight up falls under the aggressive panhandling. Uh, the biggest one that you can probably touch on with all the old market is panhandling on private property without permission from the owner. Uh, again, it's going to fall to more of a survey line that the business would have to conduct at their own expense to figure out where their property line starts and stops at. But if they're on that private property and the owner hasn't given them permission to be here, that's an easy way we grab them. I know we deal with parking lots out in West Omaha. When I was on patrol as an officer, that was one of the biggest ways we tackled that was just going after them because the owner doesn't need to be a victim right away. You just ask them, do you have permission from the owner to be here? By and large, they don't. Um, and then blocking the path of the person or kind of standing in the way of them getting past them would also fall under that as well. So those are the big ones that would fall under the aggressive panhandling. Panhandling in general was deemed free speech, so we can't just go out and target any and all panhandling like we used to. I think that changed about seven years ago now, seven years Probably, ago. Yeah. Um, so that's why they came up, the city came up with that pan, aggressive panhandling ordinance, uh, which we can enforce. And uh, in terms of panhandling, that's something we would have to be called on. The rear front officers wouldn't see that and just stop voluntarily. It's one of those things someone would have to call us and be a victim of in order for us to enforce. We can't enforce it without a victim. That's going to be a case by case basis, obviously. But if anyone's being mm -hmm. aggressive or abrasive, um, please call police. Don't, don't approach them. Let us go ahead and um, take care of the situation. Perfect. Thanks, guys. I'm going to um, again. I'm going to answer this question in the chat here about. Um, we do have two other really fabulous questions in the chat that I'm going to throw out really quickly before we open it up in case anyone has other stuff. Um, Scott Jacobs asked, what happened to the uh, cleaning up of the alleys? Um, we still, our teams do still go through the alleys and um, and do um, reactionary power washing and, and all of that. But the alleys are uh, like the sidewalks. They are actually the purview of the property owners themselves. So um, the property owners are responsible for keeping it clean, keeping snow out of the way, um, even even responsible for keeping the surfaces uh, well done. Now we know that that's a big job, especially in old market where there are hundreds of property owners along the you know that whole route. So it takes a huge effort. So our organization does attempt to come in and uh, try to be the middle person in all of that. Um, there was a huge effort a couple of years ago. We did a big analysis that was paid for by the city um, that gave us a roadmap of all of the potential 
of what we could do in alleys. Um, it identified all of the things that were wrong, everything from uh, too many dumpsters to bad lighting to bad surfaces to you know to all of that kind of stuff. Um, we have been able to address a few of these things in the last few years, but it again, our organization does not necessarily have the resources to actually implement a lot of the things that we advocate for. Uh, but the number one thing that would help clean up those alleys is dumpster consolidation. And this is something that we've been working on for years, but it is an effort that, that again, it takes working with all of the different owners at the same time. So it can be really complicated. We have, have seen a lot of success along alleys where one property owner took the initiative to talk to all of, of his buddies and um, and they were able to get a great deal with Abe's. Uh, we've also got some good folks working with Papillion Sanitation. Um, and what this means is that instead of having every business have, have, have one or two dumpsters, it goes down to one or two big compactors in the alley and everybody uses the compactor. It cleans everything up. Um, everybody's rates usually go down a little bit too because everybody's paying one bill as opposed to a whole bunch of different things. So um, again, if anybody is interested in, in hearing more about that or what you can do to organize on your own, what we're doing, trying to organize big picture, happy to answer some more of those questions. Um, and again, those reactionary phone calls, if you go through and you see that somebody's grease dumpster has been knocked over or that that something, you know, somebody's left a huge big mess, those are the things that you can call us and we can come down and, and clean up. Um, we just do not have the, the manpower to uh, go back into every single alley every single day. We do drive through them to make sure that there isn't anything crazy, but um, but that doesn't get it as clean as it possibly could. Um, so so please do let us know if there's anything um, specific and let us help you help getting the, those smaller um, projects done that are they're much easier to do if you are working with a group. Um, somebody else had asked a question about, will this group be taxed with, uh, tasked with making sure that the future streetcar feels as safe as the park does with private security? No, that's not going to be on our shoulders, but it will be on our advocacy shoulders. We will absolutely be working with the streetcar authority to make sure that they have, um, proper security on, on the cars. Um, and, and right now that is 100% part of their plan is that they do have, a good security plan in place. Um, if anybody has been down to Kansas City recently and ridden their streetcar, their streetcar, which not only generated hundreds of millions of dollars of development of which we are just starting to see, um, but they also have had very low crime rates because of their security plans and the way they've been implemented. And our uh, streetcar authority is, uh, is modeling a lot of what we're gonna be doing on that. So, um, so again, no, that's not directly on us, but heck yes, we'll be advocating to make sure that they're doing everything right. Um, one last question that I wanna touch on that's in the chat, and then I'm gonna open it up in case anyone has anything else. Um, we have a property owner that was talking about sidewalk repairs. The, a couple of years ago, the city went through and um, um, sent out letters to almost every property owner in Old Market because the sidewalks were in such bad shape. A lot of those sidewalks got fixed and we're already starting to see cracks again. We live in the Midwest. Cement is really, really difficult to keep um, uh, maintained. Um, but what this guy is talking about is that there's still a ton of sidewalks that are in poor condition. So um, there, the property owners that, that are still having issues, either it's because their issue is huge. And when I say huge, let me explain this. Most of the properties in Old Market are built on top of the properties that were there before. 100 year plus infrastructure. We've got streetcar lines that were under the ground. We've got power vaults that are there. It is almost um, it is almost impossible to find a piece of sidewalk in Old Market that doesn't have something really weird going on underneath it. So the sidewalks that are still in disrepair are because it is a multi-million dollar project to repair them. And it's a much bigger deal than just coming in and re-cementing. Um, so I know that that we're still dealing with a lot of that. Uh, we also have a lot of property owners that responded to that effort saying, 
Um, we're about to renovate. We're going to do this, that, and the other. And they had, uh, I want to say it was up to five years if they had filed construction plans and things. So um, the the question in, in the chat specifically mentions 12th and Harney. That whole area is actually under construction and the sidewalk repairs are included in it. If after the construction is over, things have not been repaired or we're still seeing issues, then we'll have the city come back in and, and, and redo that. So hopefully we will, over the next few years, start to see um, a little bit more of that kind of repair. Um, at this point, is there anyone from the audience that has another question? Christine, are they able to ask them or do they have to put them in the chat? They can uh, raise their hand and I can allow them to chat or to okay. talk. Okay. So if anybody has a question, let us know. Okay. I did want to mention Holly really quick. <clears throat> I didn't touch on the question that Ta asked rules or maybe guidance for approaching people, ways to help them that are experiencing homelessness. I did a month ago and I probably drop the ball my fault christina uh sent some like guidance uh interacting people that are experiencing homelessness in your neighborhood i was going to i think just pretty it up a bit but you could share it if you want to christina that's totally fine um also i'm always more than willing to meet with businesses and property owners or anyone and talk with them about their concerns one-on-one -on -one or with a group just feel free to reach out. Thank you, Tamara. I think that in itself is a really nice resource. So again, if anybody would like to talk to Tamara and ask specific questions, um, have a one-on-one -on -one and talk about maybe your own specific situation, um, because we know that every situation is a little bit different. So um, so she is available for a resource, as are, as are we. So please feel free to reach out and ask. And again, we always, uh, you know, we, we want to reiterate um, anytime you want to offer assistance, you, you need to make sure that, that you feel safe and that's always going to be up to you. My threshold is, is pretty high as far as going up and talking to strangers. Um, and I often have my dog with me and he is a good judge of character. So, um, so I'm not afraid to get into situations that sometimes maybe I shouldn't. Um, but, um, but I also know that, that there are a lot of folks that, they're not gonna feel comfortable at all. So those are the situations that, that you need to just gauge on your own. Um, and if there is any question whatsoever, call 911. That's just, that's the bottom line. Um, the dispatch and the officers themselves will determine if once they get there, there isn't actually a situation or if maybe there's something going on that, that had been missed. So, um, all right, Tim, do you have anything you wanna add? Not really much to add, um, just maybe reinforce. I think one of the most impactful things we do is hold the monthly meeting where all of the folks in the relationship involved in the relationships that I mentioned earlier get together and discuss uh, recent events, trends, what we're hearing from business owners, residents. Um, and, and that is really impactful to how we leverage our resources and the, the things that we can bring to the table to improve the safety in the district. Really. Um, police, Lionsgate, anybody have anything, final comments? No. All right. I would just want to touch again, if you wanted that uh, trespassing enforced, I would need a running list of every business that wants it as well as their info. Um, and just be weary that they will, if they wanted to enforce it, I would need to get that ahead of time. I was going to run the list myself and go up to business individually. And then I found that undertaker required about 400 different contacts, but I just don't have the time for my normal regular routines. If you guys yeah, coordinate that or send something out, we could do that, but I would need that list uh, presented to me that I could pass on to the rural front officers. That would be great. That would be great, Dan. Well, we we have offered that up as a as an idea before, and um, um, and we haven't had a lot of takers. Although when we talk about it, people go, "Oh yeah, that's actually something we should do." So, um, so it's we'll kind see. Of a mixed issue because some people are very for it and some people are very against it. So I understand it, it can be kind of a hot topic for some people not wanting to participate, which is obviously no problem at all. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think it's probably one of the hardest things that we that that those of us that live and work down here. Um, again, the homeless community is part of our community, and um, and we see them and interact with them every day. But we often have a lot of visitors that come in that um, that either it's their first time seeing a homeless person or uh, or they're nervous anyway, just because they're coming into a new environment. So it, everybody feels a little bit different and we just wanna make sure that, that we stay as compassionate as possible, um, but that we are also eagle-eyeing the, the safety concerns because, because there are some out there. Um, okay, so again, there, there are people that you can call and talk to if, um, if you are interested. Um, I am always available either for uh, complaints or uh, criticism um, or, or ideas and things. Tamara is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings to come down. Um, we can also get you in touch with any of our security officers. Um, and please just let us know what we can do. Uh, the other resource that we always want to throw out there with that I apologize that we didn't have it on the slide here, but it's the mayor's hotline. That mayor's hotline is incredibly helpful and you can call for absolutely anything. Um, graffiti, uh, a, a car that's stalled, a light that's out, someone is doing something bad, or if you just have a random question or complaint, they're on the hotline, not only are the staff trained to be able to answer all those questions, uh, but they also, um, the mayor actually pays attention to every, every call that comes in. And sometimes, the DID will actually do a campaign while we, where we will say, Christina has just put the hotline uh, information in the chat. So if you wanna save that, um, you can also Google it very easily. Um, the, uh, we, we often do campaigns to the mayor's hotline saying something like, hey, we are having, everybody has been experiencing X, Y, Z issue. And if we get 10 people that make phone calls to the hotline, the mayor sees that 10 people called about the same issue and she'll call me and say, what's going on? And, you know, then we can again, get things a little, uh, get things moving along, but she really does pay attention to those. So when you are calling, if you are calling about a specific issue that other people are dealing with, I encourage you to have them call too. So it makes a huge difference. All right. Um, we are joined tonight by a whole bunch of board members on the DID, um, some friends from the Old Market Association. I see a lot of familiar names in, in our participants list. So um, I just, again, would encourage you, please call, whether it's a complaint uh, or whether it's a, um, a compliment, we like those too. Um, and uh, just one more shout out, we do have a position open on our Clean and Green team. So. Um, this is a great summer job for a high school student. Uh, it's also a great full-time job for anybody that is interested in being in a service and maintenance outdoor manual job. We provide winter clothing even. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, everyone who's um, all of our panelists. Um, thank you so much to all of our uh, board members and volunteers who are here. And a huge thank you to my assistant, Christina Randall, who runs everything. All right, guys. Thank we'll you. Be safe.